All right, everybody, welcome back to the Strong Life Podcast, episode 425 with Mike Jolly. Mike and I met 2016, where we were trying to think about it, Summer Strong, early days, uh, creator of the Iron Neck. And uh, when we met at Summer Strong, we spoke about lots of things like your training for football at UCLA and uh, being looking young, being healthy and strong. Now you're in your 60s. So 2016 was eight years ago. You were in your 50s. And when you told me that, I was like, oh, I thought you were like 42 or something. And I said, this is why. <laughs> like strength strength training is like uh, the ultimate fountain of youth. So Mike, welcome to the Strong Life Podcast. Great to see you again. Um, I haven't seen you at, a, at the live event. I must be going to the wrong events. What? <laughs> Well, well, I do show up at the strength, the strength and conditioning shows like NSCA. And oh, CSC, yeah. And yes. Those, those. But yeah. Yeah. I haven't seen you in a while. It's great to see you, Zach. Been great a long to, time. Great <laughs> to see you. So I know uh, I was just in Florida and I didn't know they were holding. Um, I didn't even know what was going on. I think it was called Nike Coach of the Year. So, it's a, so that's a strength and conditioning clinic. But was a month ago was the NSCA clinic in Florida? Yeah, I believe it was. Or were you there or no? I, I was not there at that one. <clears throat> the last Got one it. I went to was in Vegas. It was the uh, NSCA Tactical Strength and Conditioning show. Oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. That that was a pretty good show. It was it was, it was good. That <clears throat> is a good good group of people. So um, the military, since we spoke, actually, Mike, the, that military sector has exploded. Um, <clears throat> they're putting a lot of money into that. Uh, what's like? What was the response? Were those guys very hungry to uh, learn from you and connect with you di differently than um, the strength coaches working in the sports? Yeah, absolutely. They have been. It's funny because I, I started off with the military down in San Diego uh, where the Navy SEALs train. Yep. And the funny thing about that was I went down there because I wanted to, the Navy SEALs to use the product because they need it. They need a strong neck. Uh, they, you know, they have concussions and all of that. They have their night vision gear. It's like 13 pounds that they wear. So they need a strong neck. And so I went down there and I met with the master chiefs that train the Navy SEALs and they take them through, you know, their basic training. And the master chiefs, they bought iron necks for themselves. Of course. Because they wanted to be tough. <laughs> and they wanted to kick those guys' asses. They didn't put him in the gym for the Navy SEALs. They put him in the gym for the Master Chiefs, <laughs> which I thought was funny. That but, is funny. But I mean, since then, yeah, since then we've uh, we're in a lot of a lot of gyms. Camp Pendleton, which is just south of where I live in San Clemente, in California, they have a hundred and I think it's over a hundred and twenty gyms on Camp Pendleton itself, and there's several of those gyms that have iron necks in them that they bought. Um, we were in Air Force. Air Force loves us. Yep. The Air Force has actually done two studies on the Iron Neck. So that was pretty cool. I was at the same conference we were just mentioning that NSCA's, uh, you know, TSAC conference. And they they said, yeah, for a hundred dollars, you can get up on the stage. and You can talk about anything you want to talk about. And I said, OK, I'll do it for a hundred dollars. So I got up on the stage and I had my Iron Neck and I went through my Iron Neck spiel up there on the stage. And afterwards, an Air Force pilot came up to me and he said, hey, do you have any idea how bad pilots' necks are? And I, and I didn't. I had no idea. But I found out later that um, I found out later that when a, F, when a pilot takes off from an Air Force base on, in an F-16, they pull four Gs immediately at takeoff. Their necks are so jacked up. So I met with him, and then I met him at Luke Air Force Base in, in Phoenix, Arizona, where they train all the newbies coming out of the academy on how to fly an F-16. These, these pilots that do all the training, their necks were so bad. I mean, really, really bad, Zach. I couldn't even believe it. So we did a study with them. Uh, it went for over a year, and they used the iron neck to try to rehabilitate their necks and it turned out great i mean we, I, I was working with pilots they could, they were you know they were like this right pretty soon they're just looking around like this yeah. i mean how important is it for a pilot 
to be able to look up out the canopy behind him, check his six. If you can't do that, you don't know what's back there. And, you know, you've, you better be able to move your head and neck around. But anyway, they did this study, published it, and talked about the, 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 the rehab of using the iron neck and how effective it was. Then from that, I had an Air Force pilot um, that was in charge of a squadron out of England that would rotate into the Middle East. And they wanted an iron neck, sent them an iron neck. They did a study for two years on using the iron neck in combat, warming up before you take off, rotating into the Middle East, having it with them all the time. And both of those studies came out of Wright Patterson, you know, Air Force Base, and man, alive, to speak really high, highly of the iron neck. And, and to me, you know, I invented it to protect brains and, you know, to save people's lives because we can, we can get into, into who's, who, what people I lost that I played with at UCLA and played against when I played college football. But uh, it's just another part of the Iron Neck getting out there and actually saving people's lives and making lives better uh, by, you know, fixing their, fixing their necks. But yeah. So we, we, we love to be, love to support the military. My CEO actually was a tank commander in Iraq. I mean, he, he commanded a whole squadron of tanks, Sean Supon. So yeah, we are, we're big. We're big with the military. Yeah, and what's uh, interesting, like you mentioned UCLA, so I remember you telling me you played football at UCLA. So were you there, what, early 80s? I was, but it, it was late 70s, early 80s. Late 70s, <laughs> so early 80s. So I got there in, yeah, 78 to 82. Yeah, which, <clears throat> like I have um, <clears throat> a lot of these older <clears throat> training manuals, and neck training was always something in a lot of them. Um I probably can't. Oh, so there's a that there's one book I have. It's called Conditioning for Football. I think it was from the 80s. Tom Zapanic, Zapanchik. I can't remember where he was. Um, but there's some, you know, neck training. When I was a kid, when I got to high school, 89, had the old four-way neck. So when you went to UCLA, mm -hmm. did you do was was strength and conditioning in the high schools a thing? like going getting ready for college or were they still saying it'll make you slow and muscle bound <clears throat> well my school didn't really even have a gym we had one of those four station universal gyms you know i had a yep. leg press on one side a pull down on one side you know one of the bench presses on one side that was the only piece of workout equipment we had luckily though i wrestled so you know i was a heavyweight wrestler and i had a i had a large neck a big, you know, big, strong neck from bridging and, you know, working on it, letting people crank on it. It just, it just was big and strong. I just got lucky. Um, I didn't get concussed when I played football at UCLA through four years. And the reason is I had a strong neck. I could dissipate those forces and those blows to the head. So, and prevent the brain rattle from happening. It's uh, a, <clears throat> I wish more, you know, we say this all the time. You see it on social coaches encouraging <clears throat> linemen to wrestle but football players will outright tell me it's too much conditioning i don't like it it's too hard and when i wrestled in high school just we just did bridges but you also mentioned like the people the, the wrestling in and of itself building the sure. neck so um when you were at ucla what did the did you guys have a strength coach how did things uh, look for you when you were playing football late 78 through 82 because some programs did have it and there was a guy who I think worked with the uh, Raiders but I, I can't remember what year it was I, I've posted photos of it I think it was the 70s <clears throat> yeah so when I went there on my recruiting trip it was funny it was UCLA you know Beach Boys all that kind of thing we had two bench presses outside the locker room outside Yep. The locker room, two bench presses. It fenced in. That was the gym, believe it or not. When I got there, though, they were in the process of building a, a new facility. And when I actually checked, you know, got there in the next spring, um, it was done, which was great. It was all Nautilus equipment, though. So, you know, machines. that was when Nautilus was like a big deal. It was all machines and, 
Um, eventually, after two years of that, they put in some squat racks and we, you know, we start, started getting after it. But Nautilus did have a four-way neck machine that we would use. But I also wrestled at UCLA. That's when UCLA still had a wrestling program. Title IX knocked that out after my, I wrestled for two years. Title IX knocked it out. They got rid of the wrestling at UCLA and, and swimming and men's gymnastics and water polo, which they eventually brought back through the alumni. But uh, the wrestling program was really, really strong at UCLA. My freshman year, Fred Bono won the national championship and that's who would beat me up. So I'd come out in terrible shape after football season, right? It was over. We had, my freshman year, we played in the Fiesta Bowl, played Arkansas. After the Fiesta Bowl was over, I, I you know, went home for two days for Christmas, got back to school and went right to wrestling and just got just destroyed. I mean, like you said, condition, right? Oh my gosh. But Fred Bono, he was, he was, you know, he was on the U.S. team. He was, uh, he won the national championship. He beat me up, but boy, did I learn a lot. <clears throat> so I was really excited about my sophomore year coming up because he taught me so much and he was graduating. Who was the wrestling coach there? <clears throat> oh, I knew you were going to ask me that. And I, <laughs> I, you know, I'm 64. So once in a while, yeah, you know, I know that feeling. My mind. And, and this is one of those times that it's I'll look it up. Mind. <clears throat> yeah, look it up. Yeah, check I, it out. I, so he was, I wonder if he's he was, related. Oh, go ahead. He, he was a little crazy, the wrestling coach. <laughs> I mean, That's once great. in a while, uh, no, I'm, Zach, I'm not kidding. Once in a while, he walked in the wrestling room with a shotgun. True <laughs> story. I think we had these conversations <laughs> at Sornex. I also forget uh, <clears throat> he walks in. So where was he originally a California guy? That doesn't sound very California. She sounds like no, he was it, from. It, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's a pheasant hunter from the Midwest someplace. Is probably where he was from. That is interesting. <laughs> All yeah, right, so yeah. I will Google that, Mike, and I'll find out mm. um, who that was. There is a uh, wrestling coach. He's at Wisconsin now, but he was a Florida guy. His last name was Bono. He's a little older than me, so maybe he's 50 or 52. His name was Chris Bono. He was a he wrestled mm. at Iowa State, but he was from Florida. But that's a that's a common last name. So I love kind of digging into those mm. older training methods. So Nautilus, I re yes, was crazy popular. Were they doing the uh, high intensity one set to failure type circuit with you guys? Yeah, we did. We did do that. We did do that. We would do. I think we'd go through five sets, and we'd start, you know, the warm up set, and we get down to just the one, you know, one one rep. Just go. Just try to get one rep. But we'd yeah. fail. We we go to failure every single time. And you know the <laughs> old, the best Nautilus machine. <clears throat> It was a pull, it was a pullover machine. Yes. Do you remember the pullover machine? Oh, oh yeah. my gosh. That was that was such a great machine. I just I just got done watching um Arnold on the Netflix documentary. Yes. And half the time when he when, when they show him now in his 70s working out, he's always doing the pullover machine. Right. And I was like, oh, I love that machine. I wish I could get one of those. <laughs> you could. I've seen uh, my friend Joe Ken, mm -hmm. Big House Power. Um, he was when, when you and I met, he was coaching at the Carolina Panthers. So I, I wonder yep, if you guys probably communicated. Uh, I think he had an iron neck. I just visited him. I think I saw one in his yeah. garage. Yep. Yeah, he um, does. He has an iron neck. He's actually yep. done some stuff for us because he, you know, he's go. a big neck guy. Yes. Mm -hmm. He actually created a course, you know, called reinforcement, which I think is so much deeper than a neck course. It's like, the, how the trunk stabilizes, you know, works and kind of integrates with the spine. And, um, you know, like I said, it's been a bit since you and I first met, but I remember I used the iron neck mm -hmm. and I remember telling you, I feel it in like my, uh, my QL muscles, like my trunk, my spine. So it wasn't, you know, I would say that people probably see the iron neck and they think neck, but it worked like my whole body, which if, you know, well, the old four-way neck machine, which I had, I, I think it was made by Nautilus. They were plate loaded. You know, you're sitting mm -hmm. down. So it, it shuts off a lot of your body. Whereas, um, right. you know. The and it way, allows you to cheat too, right? I mean, right, it really allows right. you to throw your, your body, body right into it and really cheat. Yes, What's when they brought in equipment and started doing like squats and whatnot with you? 
Boo, did you guys have a strength coach or did football, the football coach run the weight room and did, did also the same with wrestling? What did the training look like for each sport? We had a strength coach. We had a dedicated strength coach. He was a great guy. And um, it was, it was fun. He put together a pretty fun workout. It was a pretty competitive workout. It was nice when we got into the, you know, the squatting and the clean cleans and jerks and all, and all of that and deadlift. That, that was really nice. We, st- we started putting on a lot of strength at that point. A lot of us came from schools, high schools that just didn't have any kind of strength program at all. So when I, when I finished high school that summer, I went to, this, uh, went to this big meathead gym, you know, it was in some strip mall and just, it was just a bunch of big meatheads in there. And that's how I learned how to lift weights, you know, and I, I've got, a, I gained a lot of strength that summer, uh, you know, just throwing iron around with these guys. And they were, they were really cool. They took me under their wing and, and, you know, taught me how to, how to lift. Those their way. <laughs> yes. Because Mike, that era of the eighties of the uh, action movies, they say was a very big reason why my generation, your generation was actually strong and fit because you would watch those movies and they inspired you to do, to run, do push ups and do curls. So if you watched any Rocky film, you copied it. <laughs> and then in the eighties, yeah. you had um, Sly with Rambo, not just Rocky. And you had Arnold. Yeah. I, I remember watching Predator for my brother's birthday. I think I was, I don't know if I was eight or 10. But we went to the movie theater to watch Predator. And he's like, you just wanted, you wanted to lift. So when you were in California, where, where did you grow up? What was that area? I grew up in Oregon. I'm in Portland, Oregon. Oh, I was in high school up there and got recruited and came down to UCLA. Very cool. And your strength coach at UCLA was different for wrestling and football or same guy? No, the, the wrestling coaches actually we are strength coaches for wrestling football had their own dedicated strength coach. <clears throat> yep. And what did you weigh in uh, college as a wrestler? How much did you weigh? Uh, well, when I got to college, I was about 240 pounds. I lifted as hard as I could and I, I gained maybe five pounds. Really? Two years in all of a sudden my body matured. Right. And so at UCLA, we had three training tables. We had, Eat, sit here because you're not big enough and you were going to make you eat as much food as we can possibly make you eat. Then they had the, the training tables where you're fine, you can eat what you want. And then they had the training tables where you're too big and you're not going to eat very much because we need to get you, you know, we need to cut some pounds, right? So summer, summer came and I started lifting hard and my body matured and I was at 250. I came back at 305. All Holy natural, God. completely natural. No, I mean, and I'm too vain to have fat hang over my my belt on my football pants. And, you know, that's back in the day where we didn't have fabric to breathe. We had the fabric that didn't breathe at all. So we had the half cut off jerseys. Mm. Remember the half cut off jerseys? Oh, yeah. We had them for game day and, and <clears throat> practice. So I was too vain for that. So I was no way I was going to have a big fat roll around my stomach. So, yeah, I mean, I lifted really hard and I come back and they go, oh, you're over on that table now. And I go, what? I have worked so hard to put this weight on and you're going to put me on the diet table. I said, no, I am not on the diet table. I'm sitting on the, you're just right table. This is where I'm eating my, my meals. But uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty funny how that, how that worked, but my body just finally matured and I could, you know, put weight on. I feel like the food of the eighties was just not feel like, I mean, the reality is it was cleaner, you know, the whole milk, I think still in the early eighties, there was milk, You know, there was the milkman delivering glasses of milk. And so back in the 80s, if you were eating steak and eggs and milk, that was a real powerful stimulus. You know, yeah, no, absolutely. We had the milkman come to our house, too. Yeah. A little milk box on the front porch. Right. I had a friend that the milkman just walked into their house every day. They didn't even knock. They walked right (laughs) in and put the milk in the refrigerator and just. (sighs) That is good. Oregon, right. No one's locked on their doors. But yeah, I, uh, I agree. I mean, I eat probably a dozen eggs every morning, you know, for, for breakfast with pancakes and all sorts. So the food was just better quality back then. They weren't shooting it up with all the steroids and hormones that they shoot it up with now. And yeah, I agree. You're right what are you, that. um, you know, you're in your sixties now you look healthy, strong, 
What's your eating look like now as you've, uh, as I always put in air quotes, quote unquote, get older? How did you, how are you changing your eating? You know, a lot of guys, as they get older, they don't want to, they're like, well, I always did this, or I always lifted like this. So what have you done with the transition to just stay healthy? So my wife is a big healthy eater, right? And she was instrumental, you know, working with me on our neck, getting that thing out there. But uh, she's really healthy. We, we shop at Sprouts. We, we buy, you know, organic food. We buy grass-fed beef. I love beef. I have allergies. I can't actually eat chicken, unfortunately. So I eat a lot of, a lot of beef, but it's always grass-fed, healthy, a lot of vegetables. Uh, don't eat a lot of bread at all. And, yeah, we eat a lot, a lot of asparagus and broccoli. Traeger, got my Traeger. Got to cook on the Traeger, you know, the, the tri-tips is the favorite. Cook those up, for, have them for the whole week, take them, take them to the office, you know, chop them up. <clears throat> do you think, uh, you mentioned Oregon, do you think you'll, uh, do you still, do you have a house there still or? No, I don't. I, uh, my parents are, are no longer with us. My sister, though, does live up there with her family and all all the all the boys well some of the boys are they're moving now they're getting jobs so less and less draw to go back to back to oregon <clears throat> and it's a little nutty up there right now in portland so oh so sure. in portland so um do you remember yeah. the bodybuilder bill <clears throat> pearl he had a gym in california yes. but he was from oregon yeah so one of the uh kids i trained i call him a kid you know he's like uh mid-20s now maybe late tw- late 20s actually uh he was from Oregon. He wrestled at Rutgers and his neighbor, you know, I think his parents lived on a farm. So I think neighbor is like a mile away was Bill Pearl. Yeah. So, wow. he, yeah. So when we would train, we would always end up talking about Bill Pearl. So um, I want to, you know, get back to like n- a different kind of neck training. You know, this is to me when uh, training works your body as a unit. So you know, the early days of neck training in wrestling, we always do bridges. Uh, there was the manual stuff. Coaches still do a lot of the kind of partner manual things. Wrestlers are still bridging. But I, I, I like something that makes the body feel like a unit, which I think inspired me when I was bodybuilding. I had I was training for wrestling as a bodybuilder with 80s stuff, you know, all bodybuilding things. Right. And uh, I kind of canceled out all, all the hard work. And so that's how kind of the underground strength methods happen. I started lifting stones and sandbags and, and things of that nature. So what was, you know, the inspiration for you to uh, be an innovator, a creator of something? Well, uh, you know, when one door closes, another door opens, right? So I was, I'm also a, a real estate developer and I was working for a big company and one day they called me in and said, we're done. You've done everything you can here. We're going to let you go today. And I was like, what? I mean, it was just like out of nowhere, right? Just out of nowhere. Anyway, I went home and literally within one week, I would invented the iron neck and I had it on my head and I was using it. So, but why? The reason why I invented the iron neck was I had started doing some research before I had been let go. And I talked to some neurosurgeons about chronic traumatic encephalopathy. What causes it? Concussions cause it. Well, what do you think we can do to prevent concussions? I mean, how do we prevent concussions? Just better helmets? I mean, what is what what can we do? And you know, these are guys like Dr. Robert Cantu and Ann McKee on that in the movie doc you know with um uh, on the what's will smith called? uh will smith movie. yeah anyway concussion well yep. i should remember that name <laughs> yeah so concussion right? great movie so you know i i talked with that boston brain group and they all said we think it's next strength i was like really next strength yeah we think it's next strength they said, this is your shock absorber so if you can prevent the head from reaching to the end of the range of motion full into the range of motion and snapping, you prevent the brain from rattling and you prevent the concussion. So if you're getting hit and you can slow the blow down and slow it down and slow it down and break it and dissipate that energy, that force from the blow, whether it's a helmet to helmet, 
fist to face, whatever it might be, you're going to prevent that brain rail. You're going to prevent the concussion. I said, wow, okay, that's interesting. <clears throat> so I was thinking about the re- back to wrestling and how big my neck was back then and, and how I went through UCLA and I never got concussed. And then I sort of said, well, that makes sense. I had a 23 inch neck. I never got concussed. Maybe there is a correlation there. So I took that and I ran with it and I went back and I said, how am I going to be able to, be, what, what's the best way to work out a neck? So, you know, I was a strength coach. I did have a, my own gym. I knew the, the anatomy of the body. And I said, okay, all those muscles are diagonal direction fiber muscles. So when they contract fully, they rotate the head. So if I want full contractions of those neck muscles, I've got to rotate the head. So I started playing around on my wife's Pilates table with some bands and rolling my head around in the bands and having resistance. And like you're talking about your full core workout, the neck's an extension of the core. Yes. So if, if I'm wearing something on my head and it's getting pulled over this way and I'm standing, my whole kinetic chain is working. The whole entire kinetic chain. I remember when I, I trained Joe Rogan, the first time and i i took the iron neck by his studio and, and worked him out with it the first thing he said was oh my gosh i can feel my whole my whole body to my toes all the way up everything's working so i'm getting pulled you know one way or the other and you know it does do that i mean you if you work if you use the iron neck regularly three four times a week you don't have to do any ab work because your abs just get toned because when you're facing away from the attachment point, the front of your body's working. But I mean, to get back to what you were what you were saying, that was the impetus behind it. I'd lost guys I played with at UCLA. I lost guys I played against um, when I was in college to CTE. And how can we prevent that? Well, we build strong necks, we prevent concussions, and you know that's how that's how we can prevent that. And the iron neck does a great job working the neck out. It's all about rotational resistance. My, get full uh, contractions. my buddy, John, like the way he explains it is trunk. He's like, I like to think of your torso as a trunk. Um, I know sometimes yeah. people use the word core. They understand that more, but the, the trunk stabilizes and you're right. It connects to, to the neck. So the uh, John also said, mm. you know, he played in the NFL 10 years said he thinks, you know, contributing fact to those guys um, who had CTE was also their nutrition. You know, you mentioned how clean you eat. He said a lot of the uh, generation that he played football with would have like a refrigerator loaded with Gatorade and just high sugar. And that kind yeah, of, um, yeah, that, that contributed. The way you were talking about nutrition reminded me of uh, not too many people know about uh, Dr. Mauro Di Pasquale, he created the anabolic diet. So John did his nutrition and supplement program through the NFL. But I knew about Dr. Mauro from, do you remember the TV show American Muscle Magazine? Mike, it was, oh, uh, yeah. it was filmed always out in California and like, you know, Orange County, yeah. LA. So uh, they yeah. would have Dr. Mauro as like a special uh, contributor. But that was late eighties, early nineties. So ahead of his time talking about high protein, high fat, where the bodybuilders were actually eating high carb, low to moderate protein and very low fat, high carb diets were the thing, uh, during that bodybuilding scene. So it was interesting. And, uh, you know, to get connect the two, is where I think people start making the most progress is like, if you understand nutrition, like what you were doing that, that summer and you put on all that size, it was the uh, game changer for the guys. So, you know, speaking of the NFL, we mentioned Joe Ken, John, which team has really um, been a big proponent of the iron neck or what coach has connected with you a lot on this? Well, we've, you know, the coaches move around a lot. You know, yes, especially I, now. I've I, never I, seen so much yeah. movement. Wow, it's just so much movement. So I think at one time or another, all the NFL teams have had iron neck. New coaches come in, and a lot of times they want to throw out all the equipment that was there. Iron neck's been pretty good, though, about sticking around because it's it's different from – you can't buy a different iron neck. It's yep. the only thing there is. So, you know, you're going to throw it out and you have to buy new ones. 
But, you know, it started back, I started speaking at the NFL Combine on concussion prevention and, and neck strength, I would say six years ago, maybe seven years ago. And one of the biggest proponents who really bought into it right away and really helped me internationally with Iron Neck sales was Mike Clark. He was the strength coach of the Chicago Bears at the time. So I, I finished with my speech and then and Mike came up and he goes, all right. And he, he walks like this. He goes, okay, I get it. I understand what you're saying. I want to try it. I can't move my neck because it's all jacked from football, but I want to put it on. I just want to feel what it feels like. So I put the iron neck on, on Mike and I back him up and stretches out the, the band and get him to out to about 25 pounds of resistance. And I said, okay, Mike, stand there and just try to look left and look right. Just try. And he, goes, he went like this. He goes, and, and Zach, I'm not kidding you. This is the craziest story right away. And he's getting this big smile on his face. He's like, oh my gosh, I, I've been able to turn my head this much for 20 years. And he, and I, I'm, taking him through all the exercises. And when he's done, he's just, he's just like this. He's like, oh my gosh, this is unbelievable. So he became a huge proponent because it fixed his stiff neck. It really helps with mobility, range of motion, flexibility. It helps so much with that. And that's also important with concussions because if I have a very flexible neck with, with a good range of motion, I have a longer time to slow the blow down before my head reaches the end of its range of motion and snaps. So that flexibility and range of motion is really important. So Mike goes back to Chicago Bears. He orders a bunch of iron necks. Then the All Blacks come in from New Zealand into Chicago, and they're doing this some, some kind of an exchange program where the All Blacks are working you know, with the Chicago Bears, and they're training with the Chicago Bears. So then I get a call from the All Blacks saying, oh, my gosh, we, we love this iron neck. We, we need them. We need them right now. We can take them in our suitcases with us. Because they never at a home gym. They're always traveling. They go to three different continents to, you know, to, to compete in rugby. So they wanted something they could take with them, with them. So it got to the All Blacks, and then that spread in, in the international rugby like crazy. And then that went into, into soccer, which was kind of nice. Mike goes to the Washington Redskins. And, you know, one of the benefits of them changing teams is when they get to their new place they're going and they like your product. They call you right away and they order more, right? So he went to the Washington Redskins and he ordered more. <clears throat> We've had New York Giants, you know, they they were one of the early adopters um, in the NFL. Also, uh, Denver Broncos were an early adopter in the NFL. The, the San Diego Chargers were an early adopter in the NFL. And this is back when my, my iron neck weighed 13 pounds. It was all, it was all steel, it was aluminum. So that was way back in the day when it was, it was which, just a big which one did which one did i use mike 2016 you the one that you used in 2016 was half it, it had a it had an aluminum rib yep. and it had a plastic top and bottom an injection molded top and bottom that one weighed about seven pounds the one that you use now they weigh less than two pounds they're all injection molded and that was important for physical therapists, you know, and, and athletic trainers to use them. It doesn't hurt the neck strength at all. It actually, you know, it fits better. We have better haptic response and, and the disc braking system that's in the truck. So it makes it harder to rotate your head. I mean, Clemson, Clemson, they, they love iron neck and they bought 16 of my original iron necks. And, um, and coach came up to me. One of the strength, one of the strength uh, shows, and you know he he just told me how great the Iron Neck was. I love to hear that, of course. But he was telling me that he had a wide receiver on the team that early in the season was doing a crossing route across the end zone, ran into the goalpost, broke his oh. neck. But but the kid had been using Iron Neck like crazy, and his neck was strong. He said he said that the Iron Neck saved his life. And by the end of the season, he was back out there to help win a national title. They also went went through that whole entire season, won a national championship, and not one player missed a game due to a concussion. And that's Joey Bat. Um, Joey Batson. Joey Batson. Yep, yeah. he's awesome. Great guy. I I, he's I been love there like that guy. Thirty he, years. He, yeah, yeah. He's 
He's just such a good person. He's, he's just all, such a great person. He's he's amazing. His uh, I think one he has two boys. I think one might be like a rep for powerlift or maybe a different no um William strength because they're down in South Carolina. I think his other son might be yeah. a uh might be a strength coach. You know, you mentioned like the kid breaking his neck when I was in college, one of the um college my you you mentioned like UCLA cutting wrestling. Uh my college cut wrestling after my freshman year, but a freshman on the team broke his neck. And I remember seeing him walking around campus with the halo. They put like the screws oh, in, yeah. like that movie, uh, Bleed for This. Yeah. So yeah. what's um, you know, you're mentioning uh the the rehab model. Are they using iron neck for athletes uh, or uh yeah, like what's the rehab process? How are you? Here's the other thing, Mike, is, you know, now, you know, you go from, you know, athlete, then your inventor, your strength coach. Um, and where are you now? You look like you're in like a like an architecture building. I'm in a, I'm actually in a construction trailer. Yep. I'm building a hotel in Phoenix, Arizona. It's a, I, I work with a bit. I, I'm, I'm a hotel developer. So yep. We build hotels. Uh, and you know this is the job that pays pays all the bills, right? <laughs> so I've, we've got a hotel that we're building here in Tempe. It's a Marriott. It's a Fairfield Town Place, yep. um, dual brand Marriott hotel, and we're going to be opening in two weeks. And I'm just here making sure my general contractor is working hard, and my furniture people are getting all the furniture installed in the right the right places and all of that. So that's what I'm doing. I'm building hotels all over the West Coast. Uh, let me back up for a second. What was your uh, undergrad degree in? What did you study? Political science with um, minors in geography, theater, and speech. So what, I was there what, for five years. So I, I had some time to get those extra minors. Did you do a master's degree fifth year or? No, no, I just, just finished up. With those, so what was the plan going to be with political science? Were you planning on going into law enforcement or pre-law or, and also theater? Were you uh, a acting? Just a little bit. <laughs> in in L.A., yeah, right? For, in L.A., yeah, yeah. I was um, I was acting in L.A. I I got this. I was walking across campus. North, uh, north part of campus that's where the political science department was but it's also where the theater department was and i was walking across me and my buddy we see the sign and the theater department's closed no one can be in the theater department at all unless you're recruited to go to the ucla theater department but there was a sign up said one at place open auditions anyone can try out my buddy grabs me goes, let's go try out let's just go try out and i went okay why not so we walk in there and we try out and it was for a william inch play pretty dark play it was a death uh, uh, prisoners on death row you know and I, I tried out and i got the part and it was it was uh it was in this it was in the summer time where i could actually do it because i didn't have you know foot conflicts with football so i got this part on this william inch play and played that prisoner on death row and i loved it i just loved it i was like oh my gosh this is so fun and so then i decided that i wanted to take theater classes so I went in there to see if I could sign up for some theater classes as athletes get pre-enrollment and all that. And I thought I could probably do it. And they said, no, you're not a theater major. You have nothing to do with the theater department. You cannot be in a theater class. Well, I went, hmm, okay. So I went over to Chuck Young, the chancellor's office. And I said, hey, Chuck, he loved football, you know, and he, he'd be down. he loved offensive linemen. I think he played offensive line when he played in college. And I said, Chuck, I was just at the theater department and I, I wanted to take some classes and they won't let me take any classes. And he goes, go back tomorrow. And I said, okay, thanks Chuck. So I, I walk in there the next day and I know that people that don't want, don't want, really want to hear that athletes get treated this way. But anyway, I walk in the next day and it was, Hey Mike, what class would you like to sign up for? <laughs> so, so I got a minor in theater, which you really can't because you have to be, you have to be the major in theater, but right. I took a ton of theater classes. And had a ball. And then uh, eventually my senior year, I auditioned for one of the really good agency in town and they signed me up. So I, I did act. It was, it was a lot of fun. 
Yeah, I feel like the 80s, they would take a lot of uh, athletes. There was such a big, uh, the action movies was really starting to yeah. explode thanks mm -hmm. to Arnold and Sly. So, I, you know, I grew up in the 80s. I was born in 75. Um, trying to feel like if I had seen your face in a uh, in an action movie, possibly. Like, <laughs> were, were you in a uh, football movie or something? I was in a I was in a couple football movies, yeah. Um, actually, my very first part was called I was on a movie called Creator with Peter O'Toole, okay, and Marilyn Hemingway. <clears throat> this oh is wow, a, this is a funny That's story. A big name. This is a, this is a, yeah. This is gonna crack you up though. So it's my very first part, right? And it's an Israeli director. Ivan Pasteur is the director. He knows nothing about football, but in the scene, um, David Ogden Stiers and Peter O'Toole are these opposing professors, right? And they have their lab guys that work for them. They're, they're working on their masters and PhDs. Well, I'm one of the lab guys working for Peter O'Toole. And they played flag football. That's how they got their aggressions out. And they always had this huge flag football game to see, you know, for bragging rights for the whole entire year, I guess. And so David Ogden Stiers was on the other side. And Peter O'Toole's on our side. And um, I, I got the part. One of the reasons I got the part is it's a college football player, and they needed someone to direct the scenes. So I get to the set, and this is a big, this is a big Warner <clears throat> Brothers production. This is a big budget movie, and the first thing, first thing the director Ivan says, he goes, "Mike, Mike, you're going to direct these scenes. You're going to direct them. So, so just, just go ahead, direct the scenes." I'm like, "What? What are you talking about?" But anyway, it was flag football. It was no big deal. So we had the scenes that we directed, and and and. It, it was pretty it was pretty funny and i remember taking it so seriously then but we won the game because um david Og david ogden stires was was guarding meryl hemingway and meryl hemingway lifted her top up and showed her her boobs yeah and david ogden stires <laughs> who sat there with his mouth wide open and she ran around him and we threw it for a touchdown and, and that was that but that was my very first part and it was because i was an athlete um, but yeah, there's, I've been in, I've been in some football movies, of course, and, you know, done stunts and all that kind of stuff. Cause it's fun to do stunts. And when you're an athlete, they encourage you to do your own stunts. You get paid extra when you do that, which is kind of nice. Yes. Like, um, so, uh, I've got, a, a, I don't know about the best movie memory of the eighties, but, um, who was, uh, like a great actor that you really enjoyed working around, even if it was just like, not like in like a big part but you were like this person's a good person <clears throat> okay so um Piero tool was he was great he wanted to learn how to throw the american football so we were throwing the football i was trying to teach him because he, he was a rugby guy right but he wouldn't let he wouldn't let the the shooting start we sat there for half an hour while the whole cast and crew watched us throw the american football back and forth <laughs> then we had a closing scene up in up in santa cruz and he refused, it was a sunset scene where all of us lab guys were riding with him into the sunset as the credits were rolling. And he refused to do the scene every night, every night, every night. And then finally, the sixth night on Friday, he did the scene. And after the scene, he goes, you guys enjoy your week here, getting that, all that extra cash. He did that so we would get paid extra money because we, oh. we, we knew we were all struggling actors, right? So so that's kind of funny. But um in the 80s, I did two movies. I did Sister Act with Whoopi Goldberg. And then I did another one with Whoopi called Fatal Beauty, her and Sam Elliott. And I was a bad guy. I was a cocaine dealer. It was a great part. I mean, she was chasing <laughs> me the whole movie where I was trying to kill her the whole movie. It was, it was pretty fun, right? So I did Fatal Beauty first. And Whoopi had been promised to go to the Thomas Hearns, Michael Hagler fight. She goes, look, I got tickets. I, 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 I want to do the part, but I got to be able to go to this fight. So we were filming in Century City in LA, at night night scenes. Bad guys always work at night. It's kind of funny how it is. We're doing the night scenes. The fight was in Vegas and they came to her and they said, no, can't let you do it. It's gonna ruin the, the production schedule. We just have to say no. And she, was, she got so upset. She said, fine. And you know she sold her tickets. And then they came back to her the day before and said, no, you can go. <laughs> anyway she went she flies she flies back from vegas in a helicopter lands on top of 
one of the t towers in Century City. She comes out of the elevator with two giant garbage bags full of the Thomas Hearn and Michael Hagler t-shirts. She had bought t-shirts for everyone on the cast and crew. I mean, she was, she was so cool. And then like a year and a half later, I'm on Sister Act. And in that movie, I mean, I'm standing over about ready to blow her up. I am standing on top of her. I'm ready to kill her. And then Sam Elliott shoots me and kills me, of course. But I chased her with a machine gun the whole entire movie. Sister Act comes around and I have a scene with her in the bar. And she, <clears throat> she sees me and goes, she goes, Mike. And she runs over and about 10 feet away from her, she stops. And she goes, you still got that machine gun? I said, no, whoopie, I don't. She goes, oh, okay, okay, okay. Big hug. You know? <laughs> so she was great. She was great. Um, yeah, and it, it was a lot of fun. I I worked with some pretty good actors and actresses. It was pretty fun. What was your name? Mike Jolly, or did they change your name? Or you yeah. changed? What was your acting? Oh, Mike, no, Jolly. Mike Jolly. That's a yeah, good name, I mean, though. It was, it was good enough. <laughs> <laughs> they, I, I don't know. No one believed would... with my real name. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. What about um, you? Look like you would have been in. Uh, remember that movie Stone Cold with um, uh, the wish. football player, the Boz. Were you in that movie, was Steve Austin? Oh, yeah. Nope. It was, it was a Stone yeah, Cold I, I with the Boz. You were? Yeah, I wasn't. No. Oh, I wasn't. I was you in a like... movie. Called... Yeah. I was. I did a. I did a movie of the week called uh, What Price Victory. And it was a pretty good movie. Mac, you know, Mac Davis, the old singer, he was, he had a little bit of an acting career. Okay. This is, okay. This is my most embarrassing moment in my entire life. So <laughs> <clears throat> they don't want me on the football team anymore. And, you know, in the movie, they're trying to make me quit. Yeah. So he's having, having to do bull in the ring and guys are trying to beat me up. And finally, I'm just done. And I'm, I'm laying on the field and I'm, and I'm sobbing and I'm going to quit and give up my scholarship. And Mac Davis, the coach comes up and goes, it's going to, you know, he comes up he's, and he's just a big asshole. You know, he really is. And he grabs me on the shoulder and I, I'm, you know, I'm a method actor. And so I turn in the scene and I knock his hand off my shoulder, but my hand followed through and hit him right in the balls <laughs> and it hit him hard in the balls. <laughs> oh, he, damn. he dropped like a, he dropped like a rock, just boom. <laughs> And he really played. He really played it up. Like he was injured for like a half an hour, you know. And it's just like, oh my gosh, get up! But um, yeah, I mean, I shut the whole production down for half an hour because I, I hit him in the balls. That was that was pretty funny. That <laughs> is that is that funny. Yeah. And the, and that then, was pretty good. That's a pretty good football movie. <clears throat> did you continue acting through the nineties? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. I did some. Uh, I did some good movies into the nineties. I. I think the last thing I did was VIP with uh, Pamela Anderson. Those are the best legs I've ever seen in my life. <clears throat> and she was standing on top of me with, with a high heel in my chest. I had a good close-up view of those legs. But yeah, I was a bad guy on that, on that show VIP. That was on after Sunday Night Football on Fox. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a pretty funny show. You know, she, she shot the gun out of my hand. It was one of those kind of shows where... Don't kill the guy. Just shoot the gun out of out of his hand. It's but it was, it was it, was it goes so fast. It's crazy to think that the '90s was. You know, I graduated '93. <clears throat> I'm 48, so I graduated 17, 31 years ago. So you were acting 40 mm -hmm. years ago. Yeah. That's pr that's pretty wild. I was. Um, and so, what? Um, give us another uh, good movie. The 80s, early 90s. That was, I feel like, great uh, movies that inspired people. High. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, three O'Clock High. <clears throat> were you... Um, three O'Clock High was a, is a pretty good movie. All right. So, Three O'Clock High. You remember that movie? It was, you know, oh, high school. I Yeah, the kid had to... Yeah. He, he, he hit the kid that's a touch freak. And the guy's like, you and me. And, like, he's sweating it out watching the clock he's trying to like hire people he's trying to tell people well he hired me zach he actually hired me to protect him i was his bodyguard right oh so um, i went i went I into the I library remember. the famous the famous library scene right so i go in the library and oh. go, hey hey dude you that's right not and i'm touching him right that's right, right. you're hitting you him are here. not gonna mess yeah yeah i, I <laughs> and, and he grabbed my finger snapped it and then, and then he punched me, punch you. knocked me into these bookshelves, 
And then the bookshelves went boom, 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 like dominoes. Do, 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 and then do, everybody do, 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 was like all the way around the library. They were like, oh yeah. shit. And so like, yeah. But here, but here's the funny part. So they they built the bookshelves so that they would tip over. They loaded the bookshelves with books. They set up these wires so they could pull the bookshelves and get them tipping. Perfect. But when they got them loaded up with books, they were too heavy. They could not tip the bookshelves. <laughs> they couldn't do it. I mean, they got all these guys yanking all, all, all the guys yanking on these wires. And they couldn't do it. And um, the the director, he was just like, I can't believe you guys didn't plan this out better. And I I, it, I went up to him. I said, Look, I can I can knock the bookshelves over. So how are you going to do that? Said, I can knock the bookshelf over. So we set the scene up for the punch where you see you, you see him punch me. Of course, you know, it's a fake punch, but you see him punch me. But what I did was, and then, then, the, then the scene cuts to me flying through the air, hitting the bookshelf and knocking it over. So I got a little pad, thin pad on my back. I took a, about a 20-yard run behind the camera and I ran past the camera, jumped into the air, camera shooting this way, I'm back here running this way, jump into the air, flip, and smash into the bookshelf. And if you watch closely, you'll see me driving my legs in the bookshelf. So I make sure that it falls over. So that's how we knocked it down. I got an extra, I got a stunt bump for doing the stunt. The, the bad part was they didn't get it on the first take. Oh, damn. So we broke for lunch and the crew had a set put all those books up, put, put all those books back in the bookshelf. And we got back from lunch an hour later, it was done. We could, I mean, everyone was just like, are you kidding? How'd they get that done? But you know, it's not, it's not parts are pretty fun. I remember that scene. Called, do you? Yeah. 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 Cause you were I like, a series called, you ain't yeah. gonna do nothing. You were like nailing them in the chest. Yeah. And then when you got knocked out, the whole, like the students were like this. And then the the kid that yeah, you were the two protecting. guys, the guy that hired me was hiding behind the bookshelf, and it fell down. And he's just standing there, you know, looking looking at uh, you know, his <laughs> name was Jerry Mitchell. Jerry Mitchell was standing there looking at the, the bully. It was just like, okay, you're in big trouble now. Yep, Mitchell. I did Mitchell a series was called. The kid. Uh, yeah, Mitchell. Jerry Mitchell. He was the kid. Yeah, yeah. they're like yeah. Mitchell. Oh yeah, series, uh, Mitchell. 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 I did a series in Yugoslavia called The Dirty Dozen, and it was World War II. It was a Fox, you know, TV series, and every every week we were the Dirty Dozen, and we'd go kill Germans and blow up dams and blow up bridges and assassinate, you know, you know people. A lot of opportunities to your own, do your own stunts there. It was it was a lot of fun. And ironically, I was the strong man. I was also the sharpshooter and the driver. I had the best jobs in the Dirty Dozen. But ironically, my my finishing move in the Dirty Dozen was sneaking up behind Germans and snapping their necks and killing them. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, interesting. You know, I visited L.A. Uh, I spent three weeks, uh, two weeks there in, and I was like, after I was 22, maybe 23. So, like, it, it may have been the summer of 99 or mm. 2000. And you, come, you run into actors everywhere. I remember seeing uh, John Cusack. At a movie theater, mm -hmm. he was watching a movie. Oh, yeah. Um, you just like ran into them everywhere. Gold's Jim Venice, the actors were all over the place. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, it was wild. And even like you still see some of the old actors that were kind of like Arnold's bodybuilding friends. He, I don't know what they did in between the years, but sometimes you still see them in movies. Like you mentioned the Germans, that one guy, I think his name was Sven. He was a bodybuilder, not like a popular one, but then he was in the movie Gladiator. And I think he was in another mm -hmm. recent movie. So what made you just say, like, I'm not going to really heavily pursue acting. What did made you segue out of there? <clears throat> well, it's uh, it's it's tough until you're a recognizable face. So they have three categories on a casting call. They just call, they just, the lowest category is they need this person. They need to look like this. They need to be able to do this. Da, 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 da. They give a description, right? The next time they do that, they give the description and then they put recognizable face. That means when you, when people watch that TV show, they go, oh, you're an actor. They see you, they recognize you. And then name, recognizable name. 
Gotcha. So those are the three categories. And until you get to recognizable face, it's pretty hard. I mean, yeah. I, I worked a lot, but um, when I went to Yugoslavia, I was about 270 when I left and I was like, you know, I was a big, big guy. And then when I got back from Yugoslavia, it was about 255. So I sort of changed my category from being the big, strong guy to just being, you know, big and lean guy. So that sort of, that sort of set me back, but it's, listen, you, you're, you're walking in and you're, you know, trying to, trying out for a part and you have no control over it. These producers are sitting there and they, they decide whether they're going to pick you up or not. So here's two, two perfect examples of that. You remember the show coach? Yeah. The sitcom coach. Of course. Yeah. So they, <clears throat> they had a very serious show that was dealing with steroids. And it was oh, a wait. real serious show. Okay. On on coach. One one of the oh, one, one episode. One gotcha. Episodes. One okay. episode, right? And I didn't play in the NFL. I pulled my name out of the draft. I didn't go to the NFL because I didn't want to start doing steroids. And back in the early 80s, if you didn't do steroids, you're not going to play and you're going to get beat up. I was a natural 305 and I'd have just gotten chewed up. So that was the decision I made. I just wasn't going to do any drugs. So the steroid thing meant, meant something to me. So I went in and it was a player that coach had coached when he was at Minnesota on the show, right? And he'd gone to the NFL. Now he'd come back to talk to him. Well, he came back to tell him that he was dying of cancer because he'd taken steroids. Was it Lyle L. Well, it was, it was just, it was just, a, it was just a, a character. A pretend, you know, gotcha. Character in, in there. So problem was I was up against a guy that played in the NFL. He was, a, he was a very recognizable I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you who it was because you, you'll understand when I tell you the story. So I went in and, you know, sometimes you really, you really connect with a part. You just get it. And I went in and I just, I, I, I knocked them dead. The whole room was in tears. The producers were crying. The director was crying. Everyone, you know, because the scene was so intense. It was such an intense scene. It was so good. And I walked out of there and said, oh, my gosh, if I don't get this part, I mean, I don't know. Anyway, I have to get this part. I, I nailed it. But then this famous football player walked in. And I was, they told me to stay. I said, sit down and just stay right there. This famous football player walks in. And I can hear everything that's going on in the room. Can't remember his lines. He's not saying the lines correctly. They keep correcting him. I sat there for an hour listening to them trying to work with this guy, trying to get him to say the lines the right way. He couldn't do it. And then he comes out and sits down. They come out about 10 minutes later and they say, thanks guys. We're going to give you a call shortly to tell you, you know, who we're going to go with. You know, and you're like, okay, whatever. And I, I get up and I leave. And, you know, 10 minutes later, I get a call from my agent saying that um, I didn't get the part. I wasn't the big name. I wasn't the NFL guy. And they, and she, my agent said, look, they said that you were amazing, but you're not going to get the part. So, that makes me and that made me mad. Then another show called Hollywood Beat. I'm auditioning for a, a, a Marine that's gone AWOL. And he's gone AWOL, you know, for a reason, blah, blah, blah. I have a really good scene, but and it went really well. And I thought, okay, I have a good shot at getting this part. And then the producers call me in and they say, Yeah, when we walked down the hallway, we saw you. We knew you were the guy that we were going to cast. Well, that's not fair. You hadn't even seen my acting yet. What if I was a shitty actor and there was someone else who was a better actor? But, that, but see, that's both ends of the spectrum. Right. Should have got this part because of my acting. This part, they were going to give it to me just because they thought I looked the part. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing you deal with in Hollywood. And it's, sometimes it just, it just irks you a little bit. You know, you're like, man, it's yeah. just tough. Break, well, and, you know, I had kids. It breaks your heart. I have kids and I needed, yeah, and I was starting to have kids. <laughs> I needed to support my family. My my construction and, and development was always you know was always going on and always built during my acting career. I mean, some days like on Fatal Beauty when I was a bad guy with Whoopi Goldberg, I would work all night. I'd go to a job site all day and, and construct apartment buildings, and then go back at night and and you know play the bad guy. Yeah, you'd have a dressing room. You take cat naps all night long, but you know it was it was it was it was really fun. Zach, I had a great time. 
I, if I could do it again, I would. If someone called me up and said, hey, you want to do this? I mean, I'm drawn my SAG pension, but I can, can always turn that off and start acting again. But yeah, I mean, I would do it again for sure. It's like this is an interesting conversation, Mike, because uh, I was just having a conversation with somebody today. I was like, hey, man, I read I had heard about this phrase or saying a long time ago that like men should have a new a new job every seven to eight years. And you <laughs> now like you're working in construction management. Um, you're a creator, an innovator, a coach. And um, I'm also, you know, I have had like I've coached at universities. Now I'm a strength coach at a high school. And I, I don't know, as I got older, I kind of like have these, it's like, I'm open to it, but it's interesting to think of this. Like, I, I don't know who came up with that, you know, Hey, every seven, eight years, men should be getting a new job. So um, what's, you know, part of the strong life is, I get that. yeah, it's like talking about, you know, lessons learned that you're applying to life. So here you are, you've got a career plus another career with the iron neck. Um, can you leave this job? What, like, what's, you know, what advice do you have for guys out there that are doing two things? You know, they've kind of got a career plus this passion project. Um, you know, Iron Neck is international. It's in pro teams, colleges, everywhere. It's uh, also going into places where there's a very uh, big budget, you know? So uh, that's, yeah. <clears throat> that's some interesting stuff. What, you know, what wisdom can you share with you through your experiences? You can definitely, you know, spread yourself out too thin. And, and you have to figure out a way not to do that. It's interesting because, yeah, I was a college football coach. I was a strength and conditioning coach. Um, and I love that. And, and when I was a college football coach, I was coaching at a JC, uh, Santa Monica Community College, and then West LA oh, Community College. That's a big uh, football it, program, right? The Santa Monica? Yeah. No. Oh, I've yeah. It's it. a, a really good football program. Yeah. yeah, it was fun. I was the offensive line coach. Love those guys. Those kids still call me up. I love it when I pick up the phone. Coach! You know, there's just nothing better than to hear that, right? They have something to tell you, and they want to talk to you, and, and it, you know, it's great. But the problem was, Zach, that – you know, I was often as a coordinator at West LA. It's like you have a test on Saturday in front of people. You don't want to fail that test. I mean, you want to win the game. You want to put up numbers. And so you start taking time away from your other job because it's a JC and it's always after work. Pretty soon you're, you're, you're leaving at lunchtime. So you go to the college and, and game plan and prep and, and you're and you're not doing what you should be doing on your other job. Now I, I own the other company. It was my, it was my company, but it started to hurt. You know, you, you, and you no, this doesn't pay anything hardly. And this is what makes all your money. And I got, I just got stretched way too thin. So with iron neck. I made sure that that didn't happen. I quit everything. My wife and I, we quit everything. We took our, our life savings at the time. And we said, okay, this is what we're going to do. And for three years, we plowed ahead with that. We got on the road. We went to strength and conditioning shows. I just show up at colleges, um, work out, you know, with, with the coaches there and show them all that kind of the iron neck and how it works and, you know, leave some with them and, you know, didn't get sales that way. But it was singular focused. That was it. Now, after the iron neck starts taking off, what I did was I got together a really good team, a really good team. They're vested in the company and they care about Iron Neck. They get it. They understand it. It's a passion for them also. And that's, then that starts, you know, with, with Sean Supon, the, the tank commander, right? He, he's passionate about Iron Neck. Rob Sherman, who you spoke to, my CMO, he, he's vested in the company. He's passionate about Iron Neck. And when you can put those people in charge, then you can remove yourself somewhat and you can still enjoy being in that company and, and, and hanging out and, and, you know, you know, I'm still in charge. But my point is I come in and I speak, I come to shows and I help out. I'll, I'll do a podcast like we're doing now, which I really enjoy. This has been a blast. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm a part of that company, but at the same time, I can have a full-time other job. 
you know, which I can, I can enjoy and, and make money on too. And I get it. I get too bored. Mm. If, I, if I just did the same thing all the time, I would just get too bored. I, I, I just would. I just need that distraction of doing, you know, different things. And it, it's been that way my whole life. And that thing was a great distraction. You'd get a part, you'd work for three months on a movie part, like, you know, Fatal Beauty or something. And then, and then you'd be back to just, just building apartments and condos and you get another part and you'd be gone for two weeks. And that was that distraction you needed so you didn't get just same old, same old, same old. So that's interesting. I've never heard that, but, no, it makes sense now that you yeah. said that. Every I don't know. Years, yeah. yeah, I don't know who said it. I can't even remember like where I, I came across it recently, but I heard of it a while ago. And what's interesting, too, is like how you're saying it keeps you fresh. Uh, one of the guys I know was a strength coach in Long Island. He's, he's a listener, JVH, John Victory. Well, he grew up, his dad, I believe, was a builder. And so uh, I think it was during covid you know, being in Long Island, New York had crazy rules, kind of like California, New York and New Jersey were like the worst. And so he moved down to the Carolinas. Uh, he's got a family and he's in construction management. I've seen some of the former wrestlers I've worked with at the college level, the alumni mm -hmm. who are um, like donors. They hire a lot of the former athletes because they love athletes who have that leadership and work ethic quality. Um, and they teach them one guy. I know, you know, talking about football, he was a strength coach at Virginia tech. He was a lineman. And then when, um, uh, iron Mike, um, uh, I'm about to say Gittleson, uh, dang it. I can't believe I'm forgetting his uh, name. Mike was the strength coach at Virginia tech. You definitely sold those guys. They picked up iron necks, Mike. He was yeah. an older guy. What's his last name? Gittleson. Was it Gittleson? Gittleson? Yeah. Mike uh, Gittleson was at Michigan. He oh, was he was Michigan. Michigan. He was a big neck guy. Let me see. Virginia Tech. It was uh, Mike. Gra crap. I can't remember. Virginia Tech strength coach. I can't remember. So, of course, I'm forgetting. But anyway, when they <clears throat> revamped the team, as you know, you're seeing this, of course. I've never seen it so much in football. Guys moving. I've, you're seeing NFL coaches getting fired in the middle of a season now. But uh, so Mike, I can't remember his name. They called him Iron Mike. Basically, when they got rid of all of the staff, uh, he got hired by a uh, alumni who was a donor and got into like worked for John Deere, you know, like tractors. And mm -hmm. that's his thing. And he loves it. Mike Gentry. Do you remember Mike Gentry? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Sure. Yes. What a, you know who would have been? Uh, he passed away some years ago. I wonder if he – did you communicate with Dr. Ken Leisner before he passed away? Do you remember? Dr. Mm -hmm. Ken, very eccentric. He was part of the early days Nautilus, Arthur Jones hit training, but he would utilize, mm -hmm. um, you know, anvils and strongman equipment and everything oh, was that like it. yeah he, i have some old videos of his guys i'll send you uh the videos mike they're amazing but i love how you're able to uh what you're doing is very smart in business and so we have entrepreneurs who listen as well and so you're like listen i am the guy behind the iron neck but you know maybe i don't know if marketing wasn't your passion but you're what you're saying is like you're on the road, um, you know, uh, you know, knocking on doors. That's amazing. Mike, people stopped doing that when this came out. Right. They stopped yeah. doing the in-person stuff. And you're like, man, I pack a couple of them in my car or truck and I would just pull up at a school. To me, I think that's like how things are made. That's how you hear about great things happening so i like to share those lessons that's what the strong life really epitomizes is how can you take yeah. that that was basically like your commitment to sport you took your commitment to the iron neck um let's I, I don't want to keep you too much longer well, um what about any wrestling college wrestling programs that have been really big with the iron neck i'm such a big wrestling guy i love to hear who has been a real proponent of the iron neck college wrestling. Rest, well, 
Yeah, wrestling programs. Uh, John Smith, I think Oklahoma, Oklahoma State. He just stepped down. Yeah, just he retired. Did he really? He just retired. Yeah, I met with him. The Princeton he coach. Was a long went time there. ago. That was oh, on no. one of those road trips. Ah, Oklahoma. The Princeton coach, my bad, went to Stanford, which is California, but that's yeah. North California. That's that's like a plane ride for you, right, to get up there. Oh yeah, that's a hour hour plane ride. Yeah. No big deal. So John yeah. retired, and uh, one of his yeah. old uh, wrestlers who was at UNC took over, and so uh, so John Smith, Oklahoma, who I went to his intensive camp in 1990 and 1992, it was brutal. Oh I mean, man, I would have loved to have been able to do that. I love those wrestling camps in high school; those were the best. Yes. Yeah. So Olympic Training Center. Okay. I showed up What's there with some iron necks. Yeah. Yeah, up in Colorado, uh, Colorado Springs. I went up there to meet with the, the, the wrestling coaches and those wrestling coaches, they're great coaches up there. And I can't fact remember who, who, who they were, but it's somebody new now. The Roman Greco. Yeah. Yeah. I wrote, I met with a Greco Roman coach and I wrote with the, I met with the freestyle coach, took him through the workouts. And I remember the Greco Roman coach grabbed the iron neck from, from the freestyle coach. And he goes, I'm, I'm keeping this in my office. If you need it, you come and get it. He goes, now right. I can train my guys without destroying their necks. Because, you know, bridging, that's not bad, that is. I used to bridge with the 98-pounder the, the sitting on my stomach. So to add weight so I could, you know, work on my neck and get it, you know, get it stronger. Yeah. Because think about it. when you're, And then, of course, when you're doing a wrestling practice and you're bridging, you're, you're fighting off your back and the guy's trying to pin you. I mean, you, you get set up in that situation. So it's not just your body weight. It's the guy who's working on working on you, trying to keep you down. It's body weight. So, but um, yeah, they they loved it. They loved it. it. They've had it up at Olympic Training Center for years and years. And we've given them, you know, newer models. We, we right. just support the wrestling team up there. We don't. That's amazing. Uh, so, <clears throat> yeah. What's, uh, speaking of bridging, you know, of course, you've probably seen the old videos of Iron Mike Tyson. Does Mike Tyson oh, have yeah. an iron neck? Does he have one? Yes, he does. You know who gave it to him? Joe or you? You gave Joe it to Joe. Rogan Joe gave it to him. Joe Joe gives away our necks, and then we yeah. re we replenish the ones he gives yes. away. Um, we've never he's we've never paid him for anything. We've just given him in that first iron neck, and he'll have a guy on his show, and he'll he'll be you know saying oh my neck hurts my neck hurts and then he starts talking about our neck and then he has a, a gym right behind his studio yeah and then he takes him back there works it out and he gives gives him the iron neck but yeah i mean my I, mike tyson got one last year <clears throat> that's amazing were you on joe Rog? you were on joe rogan's show right i was not on his show but they just I was feature on, I, you always on they pull your clips in yes yeah, I, I I went there right before the show was going to start. He had some comedian. He was uh, just about to, meet, and I worked him out for like, for about twenty minutes before the show started. His producer filmed the workout, and that was in thousand up up in uh, Thousand Oaks area, California. Yeah. By the time I got back to San Clemente, he it's moved. about a two hour drive. Oh, right? gotcha. And so so I leave there. The producer puts the clip one of the clips on facebook and on instagram and by the time i got home there were over a million views and we sold out out of iron necks that night it's amazing it's like it was just it was one of those things that happened that kind of just put us put us past put us over you know the tipping point you always talk about oh, the tipping yeah. point i mean it was just hard struggle 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 all of a sudden that happens and then he talks about it very frequently on his show yes and it was it was a, it was a huge blessing it was a huge huge blessing that joe rogan loved the iron neck got the efficacy of the iron neck right away when he was trying it out just understood it right away and you know talked about it it kind of just pushed us over that that point where from there on everything got easier and you know we started selling our necks which allowed me to go back in and redesign it 
So get rid of all the metal, get all injection mold in there, make it better quality, make it lighter. It just, it just kicked us off. I, I can't tell you, it, you know, it was just, it was a true blessing. That it's an, that's an just amazing like this story. This show is going to be a true blessing, Zach. I feel like people normally just stick to neck training questions with you, Mike, but I love the yeah. deeper meaning behind it. So I remember when we were at Summer Strong, I used the iron neck and I remember telling you like it, it was hitting my neck in just like weird angles. And I remember feeling it in my trunk. And to me, that's real training is stuff that is, you, you know, people – the kinetic chain for those that don't understand it's just how the body is connected as a unit it's kind of would be like you know when baseball my son plays baseball and all these places are like arm care arm care i'm like well you know the arm is just the release point it starts through the yeah. feet and the legs the hips the trunk so you guys do all this bullshit arm stuff it's bullshit you have yeah. to train the whole body yeah. You know, right. and that's kind of what you've been able to bypass is in this like world of exercise or the fitness industry. There's been a lot of bullshit. That's the unfortunate truth behind it. People will sell <laughs> bullshit. You know, you had something where like, um, you know, you mentioned uh, the SEAL teams, Naval Special Warfare. You know, I love those guys because I've uh, when I was young, I was mentored by a SEAL and just like changed my life. And working with those guys, they're so um, they're so open to learning. You know, Mar my friend Marty Gallagher, uh, Marty is in his he's got to be like 74, 75. He seems so much younger. But when Marty invited me on, on his like uh, team to go and help uh, with um, the SEAL teams, all I thought about was like, these guys listen. They don't yawn. They're not uninterested. They're just so hungry to learn and that's so refreshing to be around and uh yeah. you know it's cool to hear like how you've been i liked hearing about the uh, military that you're able to work with because i don't think you know people on the surface just think oh he's probably got a lot of football and mma guys but military they say like the like you said um air force afsoc yeah. air force special ops command and the seals they have those neck problems from skydiving just going through like whiplash oh yeah all the time yes. I mean, those guys get tons of neck surgeries um mike I, so i don't want to keep you it's been 90 minutes we could go forever what's like been a question that you know you do so many podcasts or a topic that these guys don't really ask you about that you're like man i, I wish we would have talked about x you know is there anything that um <laughs> you're uh, for, uh i gotta one up the other podcast people is there anything well that i they, think you i think you already have zach <laughs> I've never talked about acting ever on a podcast and I've never talked about my real estate development ever on a podcast. So there you go. You, you've won one up them twice. But one thing I did want to say yeah. was that we sell 78% of our necks are one-offs to people that just have a neck problem. Really? 78% of our sales, just guys that just have a neck problem or gals that have a neck problem and they just order our necks and it just, it fixes it just like that. Um, I wish we, I mean, let's face it. There's only 32 NFL teams, right? How many iron necks do they need? Probably six. Because they have six squat. Most NFL teams have six squat racks. So, yeah, they, they need six because it, it hooks to the squat racks and the bungee cords and that kind of thing. But, yeah, it's it's just helping out people. But what I, what I'm, what I really, really, really want to make sure that we get done in the next couple months or the next couple of years now that we've gotten the price down is to get into high schools because brains are more susceptible to damage the younger you are. And if we can strengthen our high school kids next, we'll protect their brains and we'll stop kids from getting CTE kids. I mean, kids get CTE now, even in high school, certainly in college. And it's, it's, a, it's devastating. It's a disease that we can easily stop. If you just strengthen the neck up and, we're really, really working on, you know, getting into those high schools. A lot of the high schools, for example, will have 20 to 25 concussions and they'll work with the iron neck all summer during their summer strength pro program. And the next year they'll have less than five. Well, Mike, and um, kids will build. 
Do you know, are you familiar with the NHS SCA, National High School Strength oh, Coaches? Absolutely. We, we were one of the original sponsors, sponsors. of that organization. I spoke, yeah. yeah, I spoke at a lot of those, a lot of those conventions and, and had boosts at a lot of those conventions and we have really good support there. Yeah. What a hungry crowd of people. I really love that. I'm the state director in New Jersey, but Mike, you know, you mentioned friends that died from CTE, you know, in the quote unquote news, they kind of push that stuff down. I think last year in New Jersey, there was a couple of uh, two or three, I might be wrong, but I think it was last year, not this season, the previous two or three football players uh, died in their sleep, high school kids be. And um, yeah. And I think they were a little bit more in like the inner city, um areas where maybe you know a kid gets is feeling that pain and the and they just think it's a headache and and dad and mom are not super educated on it and so they just say we're gonna you know take Tylenol and you know just like rest a day or two and um right the prep one question I actually forgot to ask you about and it, it would be too long but was you know, you were talking about your early days preparation from Norlis to some free weights, then to going to this like hardcore bodybuilding gym. Um, preparation today, in my opinion, Mike, and people hate me when I say this, is it's so it's just too fancy. And in turn, nobody's building. I am so glad you said that. Body armor, I, right? I, it's like strength I is demonized. Agree. I can't agree with you. I can't agree with you more. One of the things that with iron neck look put it on your head and just start working out and pull that thing tight and just start working out you don't have to be so per so perfect that's nice. not how it is on a football field watch right. a damn football game see what happens to the head and neck out there and when strength coaches tell me oh the i mean still today zach i get this no the neck the neck is is, is too fragile you can't really train it what did you see what happened to the guy on Saturday or on Sunday out on the football field? What happens to his neck? What are you talking about? And then when they do, they it's it's like they they get into this. Everything has to be so perfect. I mean, it's just like no, it doesn't. It doesn't have to be so perfect. Florida, when I when I installed Iron Necks at Florida back in the day, the coach there was like, "Well, there's a lot of different exercises to do." I'm not sure my guys are going to be able to remember. I mean, how am I going to, you know, keep them doing all the exercises? I mean, it's just, it's just too much. And I said, coach, they all dance, right? He goes, of course they all dance. I said, great. Put it on their head, blast the music, tell them to stretch the damn thing out and tell them to dance. And he goes, there really? Go. I go, yeah, try it. We, we called the kid over, put the, put the iron nut on his head, stretch it out. We should start dancing. He's like, what? Just start dancing like you're at a disco a dance club, whatever, dance. He starts dancing. We had him dance for a minute and a half. When he was done, in a, a minute and a half later, his neck was blown. It was just like, he's like, oh, my gosh, my neck. I've never felt this pump ever before. Florida bought our necks. I mean, it doesn't have to be perfect. And I, I agree with you. Everyone I, on Instagram especially. The guys are so perfect about every little thing they have to do this way, you know, whatever, whatever it is. No, no, it's you not perfect. Get... It's right. not perfect in a wrestling mat. It's not perfect on a football field or a soccer field or a, so a softball, you know, stadium. It's not. It's real life. I Train saw for that. I like I saw my buddy Phil Daru using Iron Neck, but having the guys like throwing jabs and uppercuts and moving with it. So it was just love like it. Yeah, it was just like, hey, I'm going to integrate some skill work into this. Uh, what you said, I say, I've been saying a lot also, Mike, is it needs to be imperfect to match the uh, rigors of competition, which is just like the, the unknown. And so, uh, you know, right. we're afraid to lift heavy and, and uh, yeah, I mean – it's yeah, it's it's like I actually um, uh, put in for a speaking clinic at NSCA, but I had just spoken like a year ago or a year and a half ago. So they declined it. They want new speakers. But the title was um, stop 
demonizing strength. That was the title. It may have been like something <laughs> I would have like pissed off a lot of people, but uh, I'll probably save it for another clinic to to speak on that. But um, I like what we we covered really a lot of stuff. And uh, look, look, you know, before before yeah. before we quit, Jack, I want to, yeah. at this point, it's, it's, yes. it's to this point. Yes. So Helen Marolius is a gold medalist. Oh right? yeah, she's a wrestler. Amazing. Uh, she has a gold and a silver medal. She's awesome. She so is. she got an iron neck and she just, whatever you want me to do, Mike, over a Zoom call, I taught her how to use the iron neck. I had her shooting double and single leg takedowns with the iron neck. What did she just attach going it to? After it. Where, where was she? In uh, a wrestling? The squat rack. Yes. Yeah, but she, had, she there was a squat rack there too. So you attach it to the squat rack. But she was, you know, she was shooting out. She's doing stuff, just moving around with the iron neck on, not worrying about how perfect it is and am i going to hurt myself no you're not going to hurt yourself you're a wrestler you're next strong let's go and she just got it right away she you beat know, the like, uh legendary i think the lady she beat was like a three-time gold medalist olympian from japan she was to win to she win was. her first yep which she was did. yeah pretty wild and she's made the olympic team this time too so as a mom back. now yep Yep, very for third for third Olympics. You know, it's like pretty, it's pretty crazy, but um, yeah. I mean, I know we, I know we've gone a long time. I've just had a really, I've really enjoyed I had this. A, it's been great. I had a great time. What is the website, Mike, and the Instagram? Um, Instagram, I have no idea. I guess it's Iron Neck. I, I, don't, Iron, I don't know. Yeah, they that, could that, Google it. That, that's I think the, we... the website is just is Iron Neck, Iron Dash Neck dot com. Yeah. We messaged, or your marketing neck. guy, your marketing guy, I yeah. think, connected me through Instagram, iron-neck.com. Um, yep. People could Google it, and they'll come across all of that. But yeah, this was Iron Neck, and it's the first like it's the first like four hundred things that pop up now. Nice. It was hard to get there, but we're there. <laughs> yeah, man, good for you, amazing. So, any last words, Mike, before we shut it down, my brother? Stronger neck safer game boom yes everybody this was uh episode 425 mike jolly the iron neck this was an awesome conversation about life training career everything uh make sure you guys share it with a friend uh, on social please keep leaving five star reviews that helps us big time and uh connect with mike i'm gonna get an iron neck i i need i used one nine uh 2016 so nine years ago wait it's 2024 eight to nine years ago and i hate when i do a podcast i'm like my neck and now that i don't wrestle it's uh i also <laughs> feel this for the men mike i want to close out with this for the men your neck it's like sends a a uh signal of strength like skinny neck target to criminal activity maybe because i'm a dad that's what how i operate now i i think like that i'm like can i just by walking do i look imposing enough you know my buddy jim Steele once said when he was getting like leaner like the problem is now nobody gets out of my way nobody moves out of my way <laughs> you know kind of like what you said you said that uh, you know you're from 305 to 270 and you felt like you were too yeah. skinny <laughs> That's too skinny. Well, Aaron Pico, MMA <laughs> fighter, right? Yeah. Used wrestler. Started with yeah. Doc. Doc Kreese was a strength coach at UCLA, one of the one of the founders of the CSCCA, right? Yes. So Doc, Doc was a big, big supporter of Iron Neck. He loved it. And when he had his own practice in Marina Del Rey after he left and Car Carl Durrell lost his job as head coach, he started training some wrestlers. And Aaron Pico was one of these high school wrestlers. And he goes, Mike. You need your iron neck. You got to bring it down. You got to get this guy trained up. So I, I go down there and they, you know, Aaron's a little guy and he was a yes. freshman, you know, in high school. He starts using the iron neck. I went back, I don't know, two months later and I walk in and Aaron sees me and he walks up to me like a little bulldog. He's like, he goes, Mike, my head is now a weapon. <laughs> and his neck, his neck had gotten, you know, big and strong. And yeah, yeah I mean, it's just massive, that kid was right? awesome. To your yep. point, to your point, right? Yeah. But anyway, yeah, sorry That's, to interrupt that. Nope. And continue we, the podcast. <laughs> yeah, we crushed it. We could go on forever. We'll do a part two down the road. Hopefully, I will see you. 
um, at a next event. I don't travel too much, but hopefully I'll see you. And uh, everybody, thanks again. Thanks to Mike for all his time. Mike, hang tight so we could say a uh, proper goodbye. And uh, thank you, everybody, for the support. We'll talk to you next time.